Okay, so for the last part here, we're going to talk about um, patterns of circulation and how that can affect our weather and that type of thing. So if you remember, we looked at something that looked like this, and these were going to be global wind patterns. So these are going to be the trade winds that are pretty much going constantly um, over the Earth's surface. Now, if you look at this next one, these are actually going to be water currents. And the water currents do basically the same thing, right? You could see that counterclockwise circulation below the equator, the clockwise above the equator, so the same idea. And that's because when wind is traveling over water, it's going to cause it to do that same thing. It's going to create a current. Now, what's really important about this is that <clears throat> we have currents that are going to bring heat or cold weather to different parts of the world. Probably the most ex um, famous example is for us going to be the Gulf Stream. So if you look, the Gulf Stream starts in the Gulf of Mexico, and then it goes up the coast of the United States, and it brings that heat with it, so it can kind of give us a little bit of a milder climate. The crazy thing is, if you follow it all the way over to here, it actually brings that warmth to Europe. And that's why um, I was in Ireland, I don't know, what, two years ago? And I was like, oh my God, there's palm trees in Ireland, right? And that's one of the reasons, is because it's bringing that heat with it. Now, um, another one you might have had an experience with is this California current. I remember the first time I went to California, I was like, ocean, I'm so excited. And so there I am running. And literally the second my big toe hit that water, I almost died because it was so cold, right? Well, look why. We've got this current going down the West Coast from north to south. So it's bringing all that cool water with it. And that's why like San Francisco kind of has that cooler climate. And even in LA, I always felt like there was a little bit of a nip in the air, right? So that's going to be um, how currents work. Now, one that we're going to talk about in a lot more detail is going to be this current right here, the South Pacific Equatorial Current, and how that's going to affect what's called El Nino. Um, I always love to bring this video up because it's hilarious, so I'll let you see this. I am El Nino. All other tropical storms must bow before El Nino. Yo soy El Nino. For those of you who don't habla Espanol, El Nino is Spanish for the Nino. <laughs> So I just thought you would enjoy that. Anyway, um, what El Nino is in real life um, is it's talking about this current right here. So if you look at that current, it's going away from the coast of South America. So I drew kind of a little um, diagram here. I hope you can see it. Um, and this is supposed to show the coast of South America, and then here's the water. So what's going to happen is if you look at that current, it's pulling water away from the coast, like that. So what's going to happen is as this water gets pulled away from the coast, it has to get replaced. So this water from deep down here comes up to replace it. That's something that we call upwelling. And so upwelling is really, really important because it brings oxygen and nutrients from the bottom up to the surface. And so fish love that, and in, in um, conjunction with that, fishermen love that, right? So you have really, really productive fisheries right here. That's in a normal year. If we have an El Nino, what happens is this wind and this current slow down, so there isn't any upwelling off of coast, and all the fish die. The fishermen, um, they don't catch any fish, so that affects them. But it's not just this location that gets affected. If you look at this right here, this shows you all of the different things that happen during an El Nino year. So all over here, you've got drought in Africa and um, Australia and Asia, so massive drought. And then if you look over here, we've got winter storms. So I always get excited when there's an El Nino here in Colorado because that means we're going to get a lot of snow. And I was really excited this year because I said, I think this is going to be an El Nino year. Uh, turns out not so much. Um, the other reason that uh, the United States gets excited, I guess you could say, about an El Nino is with hurricanes. So hurricanes like to chase heat. And so <clears throat> what happens is normally off of the coast of North America, 
we have this shallow area, right, where the um, water comes to meet the, the land. And so what happens is that water gets really warm. So when there's a hurricane all the way out here, it's going to go where the warm water is, and that's right along the coast. So that's why you always see these hurricanes that just hug the coast and go all the way up. They're just chasing the heat. That's all they really do. Now, when we have winter storms, what happens is that ocean gets really cold and it doesn't really get warm in that summer. And so the um, hurricanes don't really have anywhere to go. So they usually spin off in the middle of the ocean. So we usually have less hurricanes during an El Nino year and we, better, and we have better winter storms where we are out here. So it's kind of crazy to look at all of these different things and think about the fact that that could affect us that much. And that's just this little current right off the shore of South America. Um, that being said, there's a lot of studies being done on stuff like the Gulf Stream and those slowing down. You could imagine if the Gulf Stream slowed down, how much colder it would be on the East Coast and also in um, Europe, in Western Europe. So very, very interesting stuff to think about as far as that stuff goes. All right. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about marine ecosystems because they're obviously going to be important. And I know you're probably thinking, well, we live in Colorado, so really, how does this affect us? But it does. The ocean is definitely going to affect us. If anything, it's a nice place that you'd like to visit, and it's going to affect you in that way. So um, marine ecosystems, when we break them up, we break them up based on the distance that they're from shore and then how deep they are. So I think it's probably easiest if I just show you this picture and we can talk about the different parts. All right, so we'll start here with the intertidal zone. Inter means between. So intertidal zone is going to be the area between high and low tide. And I think I've got a picture of it here. Yeah, so this is an intertidal zone here. You might have like little tide pools forming and that type of thing. Um, I'm skipping around a little bit, but that's okay. Um, going back. All right, then we have the neuritic zone. The neuritic zone is kind of going to be um, the surf zone, so pretty much the shoreline along the ocean. Then you're going to have um, the oceanic zone and also the pelagic zone. The pelagic zone is just going to be open water. <clears throat> all right. Now, along the bottom, all the way, is going to be what's called the benthic zone. So that's going to be where you find the bottom dwellers. And then really, really deep is going to be the abyssal zone. Now, there is the photic and aphotic zone. Photo has to do with light. So the photic zone is going to be the area where light can effectively penetrate, and the aphotic zone is going to be where no light can penetrate. Another thing about the abyssal zone is that's where you're going to find those underwater volcanoes, those hydrothermal vents, and that type of thing. So those are going to be the zones that are in marine ecosystems. Okay. Now we're going to talk about zonation that can also happen in freshwater. So in freshwater, it's still going to be divided um, by distance from shore and depth, but there's less because there's not as much going on in lakes as there are in oceans. So um, along the shore, you're going to have what's called the littoral zone. The littoral zone is the freshwater equivalent to the neuritic zone in the saltwater one. Okay, so it's just along the shore. That's where you're going to find like attached algae and that type of stuff. Then it still has a benthic zone. Um, it's also going to have what's called a limnetic zone. That's going to be the center of the lake where light can penetrate. And what I don't have on here, but it's in your notes, is what's called the profundal zone. And that's going to be a really deep area where no light can penetrate. And that's going to be where you're going to find like bacteria and worms and those types of things. Okay, so we've gone through all of those zones. Now, this next part is talking about what can happen with lakes that is important, um, and you've probably experienced this. So if we look at a summer lake right here, what can happen with them is something can form that's called a thermocline. And a thermocline is going to be layering due to differences in temperature. So you've probably experienced this if you've ever jumped into a lake and like your big toe all of a sudden hit this like really cold layer. That's the thermocline that you were hitting there. So it's a dip, like an abrupt difference in temperature. So um, what this is showing right here is how that happens in the summer. Now, if that stays like that forever, that's not good because what's going to happen is it's going to become anoxic. It's going to run out of oxygen because they need to have those nutrients upwelling from the bottom as well. So if you look in the spring and the autumn, it actually does go through a turnover, which is really important. So what happens is um, in the summer, at the end of the summer, um, you're going to have cooling going on, right? 
And so what's going to happen is this top layer might get a lot cooler than the bottom because it's getting exposure to that cold air. Well, what happens is when water is um, colder, it's more dense. So it's going to actually shift and go down, and then that less dense water that's warmer from the bottom is going to come up. So you're going to have that turnover happen there. Now what happens in the winter is you've got that ice forming at the top, and even though ice is colder than the bottom, ice floats because it's less dense. So what happens is as that ice starts to melt, it's going to be more dense and it's actually going to go down to the bottom and cause that turnover to happen. So that turning over is really, really important. Now when we talk about that thermal layering, you're going to have that top layer where it's warmer and the bottom layer where it's a little less warm. That top layer is called the epilimnion, right? So think of your epidermis, that's your top layer of skin, right? So epi usually means that superficial top layer. Hypolimnion is going to be that cooler water that's lower down. So hypo, if you think of someone who's hypoglycemic, right, they have a lower blood sugar, right? So hypolimnion is that lower water level. Okay, so the last thing here is talking about some differences that we've noticed between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. So one of them is if we are comparing them, aquatic systems are obviously going to have a lot more inhabitable space because not only do they have horizontal space, but they also have vertical space where things can live. So a lot more space for things to actually inhabit. Um, number two is that aquatic systems are going to have more stable temperatures. So you remember in 111 when we talked about how um, water molecules do that hydrogen bonding and they're kind of sticking to each other and so that makes them kind of take a while to change temperatures, right, because molecules move faster as we heat them up. So water is going to take a lot longer to change temperatures than air will. Um, number three, no shortage of water, but there will be light and nutrient limitations, right? So on a terrestrial ecosystem, water could be a limiting resource. But in an aquatic, obviously, there's water everywhere. So the things that are going to limit where things are going to grow is going to be light and nutrients. Now, this fourth one is something we haven't really gotten into too much, and that's talking about primary. One with a degree just means primary. Primary producers. Now, if you th primary producers are going to be organisms that usually are photosynthetic. So they're harnessing light energy and changing it into glucose. So if you think about what the massive primary producers are on land, that's going to be plants. So they're pretty big. In the water, the majority of, my, of um, primary producers are going to be microscopic plankton. So they're going to have high turnover rates because there's going to be things grazing on them all the time. Whereas in land, you've got trees and big plants, and those aren't really having as high of a turnover rate. Then this last one, number five, needs a little explanation as well. So the grazers that are going to be doing all of that grazing are going to be called ectotherms. So ecto means outside, therm is temperature. So that means cold-blooded in, in old terminology, right? So you've got these cold-blooded organisms as grazers. Okay, so if you were to compare something like us that's warm-blooded with something that's cold-blooded, we spend a lot of energy keeping our body temperature at 98.6 degrees, right? So if we get cold, we start to shiver. Well, that burns tons of energy. So if you're cold-blooded, you're not burning as much energy. So let's say that we have something that's worth 500,000 calories to feed a population. If you're going to try and feed a bunch of us warm-blooded creatures, we're going to need more of that energy because we waste so much staying warm compared to these guys who are cold-blooded and won't waste as much energy. So you can have much larger population size if you have cold-blooded organisms. So that's going to be that number five. Okay, so that was our terrestrial and aquatic biomes. Hope you enjoyed it.